Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Smart City Podcast by ARC Advisory Group. Today, I'm joined by our senior energy analyst, Rick Risch at ARC, as well as Peter Manos, who has deep experience in the utility industry. Uh, welcome aboard, gentlemen, and um, we're all looking forward to a fascinating discussion today. How are you? Great. Happy Very to be well. here. Very well. Good to be here. Thanks, Jim. Great. Hey, Rick, um, before we get started, can you tell us a, a little bit about yourself and your background? All right, so I have a background as a chemical and electrical engineer. I've worked uh, extensively with process control systems for uh, Foxborough Company, which became uh, Invensys, which became Schneider Electric. I designed and built and implemented control systems, especially in the oil, gas, and chemicals. Uh, more recently, uh, I've been working at ARC as a market analyst for the last five or six years, uh, and I've focused on the electric utility sector. So I cover transmission and distribution SCADA systems, substation automation, microgrids, grid scale batteries. I'm also a light commissioner in my current uh, town of Princeton, Massachusetts, where we own and operate two wind turbines, and we have a very small rural electric grid that we, we manage all the distribution systems. In addition to that, I designed and built my own net zero house, so I am kind of a grid interactive customer or or certainly experimenting with that with my utility. I have an electric vehicle that is controlled by our utility. So that's roughly my background. Thanks. Well, th thanks, Rick. And uh, Peter, you're a relatively new member of the ARC advisory group team. Yep. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm director of research here at ARC and electric power and smart grid and part of this uh, great energy sector team here at ARC. And I've been in the utility industry most of my career. I uh, started at Con Edison in New York after engineering school and had great uh, assignments all over the generation, transmission, and distribution uh, aspects of, uh, of Con Ed. And I've been in the utility industry ever since, uh, consulting, uh, clients uh, across uh, those those areas and uh, aside from my engineering degree I also have an MBA in marketing and finance and before the engineering degree I had a got a BA in philosophy which uh, I still uh, utilize as much as uh, the other skill sets uh, to ask the right questions and uh, you know bring value looking at um, trends in the industry and what um, solution providers and utilities and energy companies uh, are grappling with, uh, you know, with the energy transition. So uh, our topic today is, uh, along with uh, advanced analytics and uh, industry best practices, operation excellence, operational excellence, uh, these are all things that uh, I focus on a lot. And uh, looking forward to our Great. <clears throat> bringing some value here about electric vehicles today. Well, of course, of course, I'm Jim Frazier, Vice President of Smart Cities here at ARC, and you know I too have a degree in uh, engineering and, and an MBA. And in this particular sector, um, I have worked in developing some U.S. Department of Transportation um, API interfaces for EV charging that uh, actually were developed many years ago, but are in the process of being published in the next uh, six months or, or a year. But we thought we'd take this time um, in this podcast to discuss the um, particulars about you know, electric vehicle uh, charging system installation, implementation, benefits, challenges, um, as well as some business cases. Um, it's a, uh, energy and in particular energy in transition is a renewed focus of ARC in, the, in this year and in coming years. 
And this is uh, just one of a number of coming um, podcasts on the energy industry in general and on energy in transition in particular. So with that, we have collected a number of questions about the EV infrastructure deployment in, in North America and the United States and elsewhere around the world. And um, we might as well just get started with those questions. So gentlemen, the first one we have today is what are the basics of electric vehicle charging infrastructure or EVSEs and who are the major stakeholders in this electric vehicle transition? Rick, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, clearly the stakeholders are EV makers, the EV fleet managers that could be things like school buses or commercial buses or rental car uh, makers that are moving to electric vehicles. The real estate developers that are uh, locating the charging stations and also the commercial charging providers. And of course, clearly the utilities are a major stakeholder because they're providing the uh, power to electrify transportation. And and at the bigger level, you know, electrifying transportation is part of the overall goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there really is very few options outside of electrifying uh, cars and moving away from fossil fuels. Uh, I would also mention that the lithium battery will dominate for at least for the next five years. And there is a move toward a lithium iron phosphate chemistry, which is safer. It does not use nickel or cobalt and has more charge cycle life as well. The demand for EVs right now is just insane. We are seeing exponential growth all around the planet and huge investments in batteries and EV factories are being done worldwide. While Tesla has an early lead, China has invested heavily in electric vehicles and battery production. For example, in January 2021, only 5% of car sales in China were electric vehicles, but this jumped to 19% by November and nearly 30% by December 2021. And by the end of 2021, the U.S. had about 2 million EVs and plug-in hybrids and about 110,000 charging stations. Europe had 5.5 million uh, plug-in electric vehicles and 275,000 charging stations. However, China has about 20 million electric vehicles and 2 million 200,000 charging stations. So it's very clear that China has a huge, huge lead. Hydrogen is not likely to be used for significant amount of transportation. And I will mention that China does have about 800 battery swapping stations. Battery swapping is very popular in China for scooters. And you can go in and get new batteries, charged up batteries for your scooters and replace uh, your uh, replace the, the worn out batteries in your scooter and uh, and put them back in for a, for a fee. Char companies like NEO are experimenting with uh, battery swapping stations. So th those are the stakeholders. I would also mention uh, a, a current stakeholder in internal combustion engine transportation, obviously, are, are the oil and gas companies. And the fact that the transition to electric vehicles would if we went to 100% electric vehicles, it would move um, roughly 33% of the revenue of oil and gas companies uh, to the electric utility industry because about one third of of their revenue comes from selling gasoline to um, people operating their automobiles in the U.S. That's an interesting insight, but from from both of you, um, you know, in the developed world, electric vehicles. Uh, when we think about the adoption of electric vehicles, we tend to think of Teslas, we think of the electrified Ford F-150 pickup truck, we think of the Rivian series of vehicles, and they tend to be at the higher end of the uh, economic spectrum. Those are those are pricey vehicles in, in the developed world. However, in many developing portions of the world, electric vehicle electric vehicles as well as their charging systems drive much smaller vehicles down to scooters and bicycles um is is the market going to merge in the middle somewhere and when when do we see real mass market adoption of a you know, economy car electric vehicle let me uh let me start with that uh answer you know in china the most popular vehicle i think it was in 2020 maybe they've lost out to tesla in the meantime but the most popular vehicle was the hong kong mini 
it was a four thousand four hundred dollar car very popular with housewives in in cities it was not it was not an elaborate car it didn't have uh airbags it would not meet us uh you know uh road regulations but it was the most popular car in china for a year or two and uh although you won't see the hong Wang mini show up in the us there are 50 different uh chinese car companies and when you go to a uh, a car show in china and you look at the availability of these cars you know the very popular cars we have here the you know the the hondas and the toyotas that are kind of in the you know the entry level for a lot of people you will not be selecting them these new cars are coming they will be very much cheaper these haven't hit our shores yet but i will mention that these new vehicles are definitely coming well, it's interesting, Rick, that I, I, I neglected to mention that, of course, in the developed world, there are there is a plethora of electric vehicles at the very low end known as scooters who have dominated many, many cities, so much so that they're struggling with how to um, manage the, the scooter transportation issues. <clears throat> so uh, let's move on to question number two. So what can residential customers expect from utilities and what about that? integration with the utility of the home charger. Peter, why don't you go first on this one? Sure. Um, so, you know, a big part of the economic model for utilities is uh, going to be changed in a good way as more and more electric vehicles come on board because utilities have power generation capacity, which is underutilized, for example, at night, right? I mean, people turn the lights off and turn their appliances off and go to bed. Uh, and so there's a tremendous economic benefit which utilities can share with the residential customers of electric vehicles uh, in, in using off-peak power. Um, you know, the ratio on the worst days of the year can be uh, cost-wise to the utility 10 to 1, 8 to 1, uh, you know, the, on the hottest summer day or the coldest winter day, depending on when the utility has uh, peak demand and has to use all of its electric uh, capacity and, and purchase additional power to meet that demand. Um, and on the typical run-of-the-mill operational um, day of the year, uh, there's easily a two-to-one ratio uh, or two-and-a-half-to-one ratio between that peak demand uh, versus off-peak. So uh, charging your electric vehicle as a residential customer at the lower rate uh, is is a savings to you uh, because the utility is sharing that savings uh, uh, and and gaining gaining revenue, right? I mean, you're, you're using more electricity than you did before, so uh, it's a win win. Uh, um, and and customers can expect utilities to offer these um, tiered pricing uh, plans uh, to make that more economical. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg because there's there's so many other benefits to the electric vehicle being sort of a, a, an extra node in the distribution system for charging uh, and for potentially, th there's an economic value potentially to allowing your electric vehicle when it's parked uh, to, to act as a stabilizing uh, source for, for the distribution system, uh, you know, to um, enable the grid to be operated more reliably and to integrate rooftop solar, for example, uh, in, a, in a sophisticated scenario. Uh, and Rick, I know you've done a good bit of studying of um, the, the systems that enable utilities to have a more dynamic grid with, with uh, solar PV and, and electric vehicles uh, in the mix. So uh, I'll, I'll defer to you for some of the additional details there. Yeah, I, I think I, I would start to suggest that uh, our utilities, at least in our area here of New England, they're petrified of electric vehicles. What they see is all of these big loads coming home from work between 5 and 6 p.m. and plugging in. All right. And they're plugging in at a time where there's peak loads and, you know, there are peak load events for capacity and transmission as well. And and so they see these electric vehicles as a threat. So they're still kind of in the early phases of dealing with that threat um some of our our, our local utility has a program where we will give you a 600 dollars electric vehicle charger with the provision that you must connect it to a wi-fi connector and have a kind of our service company uh be able to 
externally regulate that charging and they would reduce the charging rate during those days that we are likely to have a peak load. This is primarily to change cost, not so much on time of use rates as it is for peak load for capacity and transmission charges. Um, and by doing this, that way the utility can save money. Uh, they figure they could easily pay for that uh, that six hundred dollar charger in one year, and they uh, they uh, they would would encourage you basically to to not not charge during those peak load times. They would they would actually uh, they would actually remotely adjust your charger and shut it down. Uh, some of the other things that they're doing, of course, there are a possibility we've had, you know, dual meters, one for a charger and one for a hot water heater. We've had them in the past. Some of the utilities in our area are just beginning to experiment with time of use rates, which require smart meters. There's still a lot of work needed, however, to create the markets and incentives for the grid interactive home. That was really the vision of FERC 2222 order. The FERC 222 order uh, is Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, basically came out with an order and uh, the utilities and the investor owned utilities and excuse me, the, the independent system operators and remote and, and regional transmission operators are still trying to develop the markets and mechanisms to be able to reward people for being able to compete in the various grid markets, the wholesale energy market, ancillary service, peak shaving types of markets. So far, that's not in place. We've got a long way to go for the utilities to go that way. And I know that uh, I would also, as an electric vehicle owner, would really like to have the capability of having uh, be able to get the power two-way flow out of my car. In other words, I would like a bi-directional charger, which also was referred to as vehicle to grid. I could power my house for four days straight, even in the winter, all electric house here in New England, if I could only get that power out of my car to power my house. So that also is not coming in the short term, but several vehicle manufacturers, Volkswagen, Tesla once did that, for example, and uh, several other vehicle manufacturers, you can see the new Ford F-150 has an 80 amp bidirectional charger that they're working on with Siemens. Uh, so bidirectional charging will eventually come, particularly with the lithium iron phosphate batteries that can tolerate that uh, those charge cycles. Yeah, Rick, it's interesting you bring you bring that up. I, I of course, live in, in um in a hurricane prone part of the of the country in the United States. And uh, resiliency is one factor that's driving some of those electric vehicle sales, in particular that F-150, where um, residents here do have generators that are gasoline fueled for, for the most part. Um, but Rick, you, you mentioned vehicle, vehicle to grid. And before we even go there, um, I'm intrigued by the Wi-Fi connection to EV chargers that you mentioned. Um, the nearer term and more infrastructure specific concern that uh, many folks have is uh, I've heard an EV charger represents um, arguably the load of a entire home. And I know that in many neighborhoods, you might have three or four or two homes per transformer. Um, what, how is it going to work when I and my neighbor or my three neighbors all decide to plug in their vehicles and they, and they still want to keep their air conditioning running at their, at their residences? Is that going to be managed by the Wi-Fi connection remotely or is there a local arbitrage or, or can, can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, we had that exact problem here in our rural town of Princeton. But because, in fact, we have a rural town with large spacing between buildings, there was a tendency to put on one transformer for one house. All right. And and one transformer, one house could serve a 200 amp service. Uh, you know, where houses are close, are spaced closer together, you might have one transformer serve three houses. <clears throat> and clearly, if those three houses all have electric vehicles, it may be uh, it's, it's going to be necessary for the utility to put in more transformers and be able to handle more load. Obviously, uh, <clears throat> a few, you know, typ typically a few uh, cu customers that suddenly put in EV chargers doesn't really affect the distribution system all that much. And, and 
kind of our existing overhead wiring 13.8 kV uh, wiring is able to handle that. Although there certainly are situations where new new wiring needs to be put in to be able to handle that load. This will be particularly the case, for example, with the high voltage DC chargers that you would not find at home. You know, these would be the uh, the commercial uh, chargers like a, a Tesla supercharger or EVgo or some of the other uh, charging stations. But but yes, uh, utilities will will need to put that in. But on the other hand, utilities see these see electric vehicles as new customers. There's new load coming up and and electric vehicles are taking on a fair amount of time to, to build out the new electric vehicles. So this gives the uh, utilities time to build up that infrastructure and and stay up to speed with the uh, growth in electric vehicles for the most part. So so Rick, um, I mean, I, I was envisioning that that the if I have my three neighbors on the same transformer, that there might be some type of arbitrage um, using software between those three chargers, so that I might pay a higher price if I um, need to charge my vehicle, and um, my my neighbor might wait because he would rather pref- uh, pay a lower cost. Do you see local? Um, I don't want to say microgrid, but but uh, you know micro bartering platforms like that popping up i would say yes but not not right immediately at least not in our area you know we do not have smart meters in our town we don't have a lot of the infrastructure that needs to be in place we also uh, need more creativity by kind of utilities and utilities service companies you know for a small muni where we have just a handful of linemen and one manager we don't have any engineering staff to to help design and put these in so we need we need uh, larger uh, utility service companies and aggregators to start uh, performing this function. That was really the vision of FERC 2222. The aggregators are going to figure out how to make multiple people participate and set up the programs that will reward people and and or penalize people for using power when that power is very expensive. And so it's kind of like uh, the the basics of physics you know voltage moves electricity pressure moves fluids and money moves people the utilities need to get that money moves people incentive by building out the business systems and market structures and and uh, in order to reward those customers that can can be a grid interactive customer and and use renewable power when it's available and even push power back out in the grid when the grid needs that power and you know it's not just that the grid will will um always it's Aside from the grid needing power or vice versa, the other aspect of it is that the very same infrastructure to support more electric vehicles for those residential customers, that infrastructure is going to make for a more stable and dynamic grid where reliability will be increased and the ability to have more uh, renewable sources of power will be increased. And you know, I happen to be in uh, New York City when the 2006 blackout happened. And when you look at the um, the reviews of what actually occurred, New York State had a surplus of power generation. And when the state had to isolate itself as the cascading outages came, trickled down you know, from Canada and across from Ohio around the Great Lakes, you know, the transmission lines, and, and New York set, the system operators said, hey, we've got to open up the circuit breakers and island New York. Well, as soon as they islanded it, because there was way more generation in New York State, the demand at that moment, uh, there were two, a couple of large nuclear power plants in that mix that had to shut down because they would have been overloaded. Now, it's conceivable at some point in the future when things are built out. You know, Rick mentioned his town in Massachusetts doesn't have advanced metering uh, installed. Well, that's true of 35% of electric customers in, in the US. Advanced metering infrastructure is only at the 65% mark now. Uh, and intuitively like to think of how these electric vehicles can charge, uh, can, you know, um, also act as a storage in some scenarios where you could, you know, serve your house during an outage. But if you had tens of thousands of electric vehicles charging in New York State uh, on a dynamic grid that had full advanced metering infrastructure in place and all the other stuff in place, uh, those two nuclear plants that caused the, the blackout for New York could have instead powered down slowly. And, and during that 15 minute, half hour transition, 
uh, charged up a bunch of electric vehicles that just happened to be connected someplace in New York. You know, it would take uh, tens of thousands of those vehicles to be there available at that moment, but that could have prevented the whole state from having an outage. So it's an odd example, but it, it works both ways. Sometimes absorbing power on the part of an electric vehicle can make the grid more stable, if that makes sense. Yeah, it almost uh, not to oversimplify it, but it but it brings up the the um, example that electric utilities are transforming from simply being creators of electrons on a on a wire on one end and counting them and billing for them on the other end. They're becoming more uh, akin to ISPs, managing traffic of electrons between you know a variety of different nodes on on the network. Yeah, and it needs to be smoothed out for it to be more stable. Exactly. Um, now we, we do have a number of utilities around here that have grid scale batteries. You know, uh, of many of them uh, participate in capacity and transmission markets. So those batteries are fully charged. And when a peak event occurs, they time that event to discharge during that one peak hour where they're going to be billed for the whole year. And hopefully they make that one. Some other batteries, however, are charged to 50 percent and could add or subtract to the grid if they were competing, for example, in the frequency control market. Hmm. Thank, thanks, Rick. Hey, let's move on to question uh, number three. Um, and actually, since we focused on residential and rural um, application discussions, let me, let me ask, how do electric vehicle owners living in an apartment or a condominium charge their electric vehicle? Yeah, this is a this is a pretty big problem. If you are one of those people living and want to have an EV and you want to have an apartment and your landlord is reluctant to install a charger. All right. In fact, as soon as you ask your landlord to install a charger, you know, he's going to have to dedicate that to wherever your parking spot is. So you better have your own personal parking spot that other people are not using. Uh, and as soon as he upgrades the panels, suddenly that may impose new electrical codes. And and if this building is 20, 30, 50 years old, you know, all of a sudden it gets very expensive for the landlord to upgrade the entire electrical uh, uh, electric panels uh, to to the latest uh, electrical codes. You know, here in New England, most new construction is required to put an EV charging circuit in every house. So building building codes require EV charging. But obviously, the older houses didn't anticipate EV charging. Um, so you, you do have a lot of incentives. All right. However, uh, many of those government incentives and subsidies to landlords, they may uh, help to benefit the primarily higher income property owners and higher income tenants. This will follow kind of an overreaching pattern of EV incentives in general, which generally raises up some equity concerns by, by not helping the, the, the people at the lowest level of incomes. Yeah, in, in, indeed. Um, you know, Rick, while it's well, not happening uh, in the near near term, um, wouldn't capacitive charging address some of these issues? Well, meaning, meaning capacitive charging out, you know, out on a road or, you know, in a, a shopping center at a stop sign, for example. Yeah, well, you're talking about wireless charging, you know, and Correct. it's 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 I think it's got a long way to go. You know, there are. There are outfits that will sell a wireless charger. You can come home and park over a spot without having to plug it in. You know, for the home situation, it's very easy to just plug in your car. So it's that extra expense of building a wireless charger into your vehicle because there's there's equipment required on the vehicle side and then also on the floor. You know, there's some possibility that buses might be able to charge at various bus stops in this way. But, you know, it's... Uh, it doesn't seem that it's very likely that the wireless so-called capacitive charging is uh, is is a big play at the moment. You know, an, an aspect of this uh, that utilities um, have to address is that uh, a regulated transmission and distribution electric utility is often obligated by its state public utilities commission to not offer something to one group of, of people in its service territory that it's not offering the equivalent to to another group. So when, when you get into uh, renters, uh, you know, if there's a, a favorable um, rebates and tariffs and, and um, not just for the electric vehicles, but also for building charging stations, potentially, uh, there needs to be a corresponding program, not just for the wealthy people in the suburbs, uh, but also for the renters in, in the uh, 
medium, moderate income, low income communities. And uh, those um, charging stations and other capabilities, uh, uh, you know, that's that's a social obligation that utilities have and, and many embrace very positively uh, because of how tied they are to their communities. They they have a stake in the economic health of their and well-being of their communities. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Uh, in the interest of time, let's move on to uh, question number four. Um, what can fleet owners expect from utilities? And I'll even expand upon that question to ask, you know, what are the benefits of, of electric vehicles to fleets? And what are some of the uh, hurdles to um, you know, having bulk fleet charging in, in one location? Yeah, uh, let me let me start with this one. Um, you know, clearly, fleet owners need to work with the utility to get the appropriate power supply and transformers for depending on the size of their fleet. You know, this is uh, many of these fleet owners are going to want to have high voltage DC charging. You know, these chargers can start to consume. You know, a whole a whole fleet of vehicles may choose may be consuming more than a megawatt. You know, even the even the small uh, vehicle chargers now are are nearly a quarter of a megawatt per charger, and there's a lot of power going into those uh, EVs. So you could imagine that uh, a collection of school buses, uh, commercial buses, you know, they're going to need powerful chargers from that utility, and the the larger vehicle fleets are more likely to be able to support things like vehicle to grid and and work with the utility on a win-win a- aspect where those fleet vehicles might be able to compete in some of these markets. Utilities are much more inclined to deal with a, a large fleet of, of electric vehicles for issues like vehicle to grid rather than each individual homeowner one at a time. So fleet, fleet owners uh, should be able to make money by exporting power to the grid during peak load times and utilities could pay for that power and, and you could afford the, the necessary metering and control infrastructure so that both the utility and the fleet owner can benefit. And there's obviously the doing well by doing good, quote unquote, of uh, cleaning the air in the urban areas or other areas where these uh, fleets are being electrified by that fleet owner. So they, they need some, they deserve some, uh, some check boxes uh, from the marketing perception point of view, rightfully for creating a better environment. You know, Rick, Rick and Peter, um, a couple of times today, we we've talked about and introduced, you know, vehicle to grid. Uh, what are the obstacles to vehicle to grid uh, communications and business processes today? Yeah, uh, I think one of the big obstacles to vehicle to grid and, and reluctance for companies to, to do this, for example, is um, is that it's a lot of wear and tear on the on your battery. So you buy a brand new electric vehicle, all right? It's got a kind of an older style battery. It doesn't have the new lithium iron phosphate batteries in it yet. That battery uh, may be good for you know so many charge cycles. It could be, uh, it could be half a million miles. But those batteries degrade, you know, with every charge cycle, and they lose capacity, and and this could affect the warranty on your car. So EV manufacturers are reluctant to open up that that charging for bidirectional flow of power uh, for uh, b- because of the wear and tear on the, on your batteries. The new lithium iron phosphate batteries that are coming out are much more tolerant to that. And uh, and I think that you're going to see um, bidirectional charging open more in the future. And obviously, you know, bidirectional charging needs to have some type of uh, – and it could be that the intelligence is in the charger, not necessarily a smart meter at the point of connection to the home or or fleet. But uh, it could be right built into the charger and the, and the utility could work directly with the charger for all the appropriate business relationships in terms of how much you get paid or how much you buy power for when you charge, schedule charging. I think V1G is referred to as schedule charging and V2 is the more the bidirectional uh, mechanism. So the, the major obstacle today, Rick, is um, is the warranty on battery discharge cycles for private vehicle owners. Would you say that? Yeah, I would say that's that's one of the one of the top uh, priorities. Obviously, it's more infrastructure. All right, the uh, bidirectional charger typically will have to be done external from the vehicle. All right, because it's taking DC power and it has to make uh, it has to use an inverter. And most chargers that are wall chargers today, the level two chargers, you know, they take AC power and push AC power into the car. And within the vehicle itself, 
is the rectifier that converts that to DC. But there's typically no such inverter in the car to bring DC back out to AC at the at the at the charge cable. So there's an additional amount of fairly substantial logic that needs to um, occur there. It's not just a simple transfer switch. Yeah, definitely it's not. I mean, you, when you plug an electric vehicle in, you know, it has to detect, well, you plug an AC into me or you plug in DC into me. And if you plug in AC, is it 110 volts or 240 volts? And what kind of plug connector is it? And so it interrogates with the communication that, when that's occurring. And in fact, you can't just pull a cable out of your car while it's charging because a spark would jump. It has you have to first of all disconnect with relays the that were designed for breaking that much power flow before you can pull the cable out of a car. So there's a there's a lot of things going on with regards to the the communication and and the transfer of power in, in not a, to mention in, yeah not to mention on the utility side the um, synchronization and harmonization of the uh, waveform between the the created waveform from the vehicle and the uh, waveform from the utility. Yeah, I think there's a, there's clearly standards for that. You know, you have uh, solar panels with battery systems and inverters that have to connect to the grid. And so there's there's uh, definitely a, a number of, of standards. I think it's the uh, IEEE 1547 communication standard, you know, that so, so you're not going to you can't just connect any old thing to the electric grid and push power back into the grid. True. Um, one of our questions, let's move on to the next one. Uh, we may have answered part, portions of this. Uh, what can property owners and private charging companies expect from utilities? Well, obviously, they have to expect clean power, right? And, you know, power that can can run their charger. Uh, you know, some uh, chargers, they some vehicles, you can't just charge them with a regular generator because the, no, the signal is so noisy, they will reject it. Um, so you have to be able to hold the voltage up. You have to, uh, uh, you know, be able to handle that. Obviously, property owners, you know, are putting chargers in, you know, and, and of course, you know, Tesla put a very large number of chargers. I think, I think Tesla has 58% of the chargers here in the U.S. Uh, Electrify America, you know, has 14%, EVgo, 8%, ChargePoint, another 8%. So, and, and then you have three different charging cables and, you know, Tesla has their own proprietary system that maybe they will be start to open up to others. So so you definitely have a mess of, of cable types between the Tesla cable, the CCS cable and the Chad Demo cables and, and also different ways of handling the business transactions of credit cards and uh, or, or uh, card readers, uh, you know, for handling the business transaction. And I think they'll all go ultimately the way Tesla has it. You walk up, plug your car in, no credit card needed. The communications identifies your car and puts it onto your credit card. I think that will be the, the EV charger of the future. Is that business model all, um, is it all moving towards, you know, private networks or are those APIs, APIs open? So, you know, perhaps a public agency or, or a city could uh, participate in that revenue stream. I mean, the the communication standard, I know that when I don't know all the details of this, but, you know, when you plug a charge cable into your vehicle, there are communication lines. And I think there's some standard communications that that occur between all electric vehicles and the charge stations to to identify, you know, the voltage levels and such. So that same communication protocol can easily carry the information about, oh, this vehicle belongs to Richard Riss and he got Richard Riss's credit card on file. So we're going to charge your credit card. That that infrastructure has not been put in place on the on the charging systems and not every public charging company are using the same business mechanisms to, to do that. And, and perhaps that's where there does need to be some work on standardization uh, to uh, to allow everybody to use some of the same different banking mechanisms to 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 hit against to hit credit cards. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit in the future with with an with an you know around the world government incentives to adopt um, you know EV infrastructure. Uh, you know what's the revenue share look like for you know for the public agency that might own a parking lot, a rest area, um, you know a public park or something like that. Um, you know, is that all funneled through a private ATM system, for example? Yeah, well, there's 
Yeah, that, that's a very complicated question. You know, Tesla put those chargers in so that they could be used by Tesla car owners right. only. Exactly. Right? And that gives them a big advantage. You know, maybe these will be showing up at gas stations and they could be combined with uh, with other entertainment or shopping and other situations, depending on the total amount of charge time. You also get penalized if you keep your car plugged in once it's fully charged. Tesla will penalize that car owner. We do not want you to sit there with a car fully charged occupying a valuable uh, charge uh, charger location. So th there are plenty of protocols and business opportunities, I think, coming in the future. And well, Rick, that that's an interesting scenario, and it, and it brings up um, you know my my question is that um, you know moving forward into the future. Do you see electric vehicle owners congregating at legacy gas stations to be charging, or will these chargers be distributed in, in you know, in, in other places, you know, around the community? Um, and if so, what's the long-term outlook for those pieces of property that formerly housed, you know, a gas, you know, a gas or diesel station? Well, I think first you have to recognize that. The average EV owner, you know, has a residence and 90 percent of his charging is going to be done at home. So that's time they're not spending at the gas station where they used to have to go to a gas station to fuel. So that means that uh, fueling at a gas station, those those people that need to charge their car on a public charging station are typically people traveling longer distances. So you will see a large number of those charging stations distributed across major highways. And so those those are some of the same locations that you have for uh, fossil, you know, fossil gas stations. So you'll definitely see some overlap there. And and I think you'll also see shopping plazas and entertainment centers and other things that could could occur as you go there. Also, a couple of other technologies occurring that batteries are charging faster and charging stations are charging at a faster rate. So the total duration of charging time is is declining, has declined several, has declined considerably over the last three or four years and will continue to decline uh, as well as new battery technologies come into play that can accept more current quicker. Uh, that puts more load on the utilities to be able to provide that power at those charging stations. But uh, but I, I, I see that's kind of the way it's going. Yeah. So and also, so, um, right. Jim, I would just add that um, you know the smaller utilities uh, are responding in in ways that fit their business model as well. So you have consortiums of smaller rural electric cooperatives in you know the Midwest, for example, who have banded together uh, to co-invest. Uh, with partners, public-private partnerships in EV charging uh, infrastructure. So uh, it, this isn't just uh, the big players. Uh, there's also, you know, some good stuff going on in, in the other tiers of the market size-wise. Much retail is dependent uh, in, um, you know, on the fossil fuel user char um, charging, uh, fueling his vehicle over a few minutes, and then perhaps r running into the mini market. Where where the high margin sales actually occurs, it's it's, it's not necessarily on fuel. Um, what is the time to charge trend looking like, uh, practically speaking, Rick? I know it's coming down, but um, do you in the near term do you see it coming down to a few minutes? That's uh, you know equivalent to the to the fossil fuel charging scenario. Well, there are some vehicle manufacturers uh, in China that are are trying to promote their battery swapping technology, all right? in which case some of those battery swaps can occur between one minute and 10 minutes of time, depending on how efficient that swapping mechanism is. That really is not taking hold in the U.S. The U.S. market, most people say, I, I want to buy my battery. I don't want to have a – I don't want to keep swapping to a, from a good battery to a used battery to an old battery. I, I – so, so that's not that's not jumping right in there. Um, the speed at which batteries are charging, you know, it's possible that some of these uh, some new battery chemistries will come up, you know, like supercapacitors and or the, uh, you know, some of the new, uh, you know, solid state lithium batteries have the potential to be charged at a much, much faster rate. Neither supercapacitors or solid state batteries are imminent in our in, in the next three or four years, at, at least not at scale. So you're still limited to, uh, you know, lithium iron phosphate and lithium nickel metal hydride and some of the other lithium chemistries that are that are out there. They uh, 
you're still going to see charging times, uh, you know, for an empty battery of, of, of maybe up to 30 minutes. Many people tend to charge uh, only uh, only enough to get them to the next charging station because the rate of charging depends on the state of charge in the battery. When a battery is very low state of charge, it, it can be charged at a much higher rate. And as the battery fills up to say 90%, the amount of time it takes to get from zero to 90 uh, would be less than the amount of time it takes to get from 90 to 100. So a lot of a lot of EV owners will will not charge to 100%. Uh, they will just charge to enough to get to their destination. So uh, as a result, that and the fact that charging stations are getting higher and higher amperage, you know, Tesla had 150 kilowatt chargers there now the standard charger is 250 kilowatts there's a there's a, a number of charging companies out there that that are going to eight you know to 350 kilowatts in in one charger for a for a car not this is not even a truck and the truck chargers of course they're going to be megawatts of charging so so yeah charging rates are are coming down but they're not they're not down to this to the speed that which you can fill a gasoline car you know, and in case in case anyone had the same pipe dream I did years ago about uh, flow batteries, uh, it's still a pipe dream. Uh, Rick had quite correctly referred to, to solid when he was talking about the batteries. Uh, flow batteries where the electrolyte is a liquid uh, that uh, is still like does not is not going to fit an electric vehicle application anytime soon, unfortunately. Where you could go and actually like change out. A discharged uh, electrolyte for charged electrolyte it just ain't happening, unfortunately. I think there is some uh, development in the, you know, for the use of sodium. You know, you go into the right, left hand side of the periodic table and you see the alkali metals. Lithium is in a very unique spot there, all right? But one down from lithium is sodium. And, and there are some developments in sodium batteries. And the advantage of sodium is sodium is. It's like the sixth most abundant um, compound on the planet, you know. Salt in salt water is sodium chloride. You can get sodium in in quantity, and so it'll be a little bit less rare than lithium. There's plenty of lithium around, but but still, uh, there are some developments where these new sodium batteries are are not quite up to the energy density of the lithiums, but uh, they may be uh, they may be a source of cheaper batteries in the future. Okay, gentlemen. Hey, our our last last question for today is how do government policies influence the role of electric vehicle charging infrastructure? Yeah, this is one where I think uh, if you look at Scandinavian countries versus uh, other countries, uh, you know, there's a very top-down structure and the rollout uh, is kind of dictated and in, uh, in ways that uh, here it is not. And um, the question of are, are EV charging stations in the U.S., and Europe going to be put at the same locations as current uh, diesel and gasoline uh, for internal combustion engines versus new locations. Uh, it's going to vary a great deal based on um, you know the position, the location of the uh, uh, TND system, you know the infrastructure for bringing the, the high power you know connections, uh, as well as a real estate play and a competitive play. I mean, uh, Rick, uh, what's what's your take on it? Well, look at where electric vehicles are the most successful, China, Norway, all right? You know, China has been subsidizing electric vehicles at the vehicle manufacturer level and at the consumer level throughout the things and, and subsidizing EV charging stations. That's why they have such a huge infrastructure. Then you take a look at some of the Europeans, you know, the the price of, of gas and diesel fuel in Norway is, I don't know, seven or nine dollars per gallon. All right, U.S. and and so that's a big impact. Norway has switched over to almost virtually 100% electric vehicles, and in some cases, electric vehicles are are looking to be internal combustion engine vehicles will be banned from sale. And uh, China, for example, charges uh, in Shanghai it costs $12,000 license fee to register an internal combustion engine that's not applicable to EVs. So all of a sudden, you see all of these different. Uh, in government incentives or disincentives to move from one direction to the other. Here in the U.S., we we do not have a, a price on carbon. There's no penalty for burning carbon and putting CO2 into the air at the moment. There's a lot of talk about that. There's uh, uh, That would have a huge impact on it. Uh, then let me see, the VW Diesel Gate settlement, that provided $2 billion to create Electrify America. 
this has had a big impact on how quickly uh, EV charging stations have getting rolled out. Uh, there's government tax credits. There's 30% rebates for chargers, and and there are different grants that vary by state. Uh, so there's a federal 2020-30C uh, tax credit for uh, available to businesses for installing EV charging stations. So you can see that government incentives and government policies you know, really have an enormous impact on on how quickly uh, the transportation sector gets. Yeah, and actually, actually, Rick, what uh, what I'm surprised that both of you haven't mentioned is that, you know, um, as part of the U.S. Uh, infrastructure trillion dollar infrastructure bill that passed uh, a month ago, the Biden administration announced five billion to build electric vehicle charging systems throughout the, the U.S., um, they are focusing on some critical highways, and their thoughts are to have the chargers within 50 miles of each other and, and create a string of charger networks across across North America. Um, and there is a further funding chunk um, that goes to rural infrastructure and, under, and um, you know underserved communities. But that's um, five billion that uh, I believe the submittals are due sometime in in August, maybe August 1st. And uh, the first winners of that um, or recipients will be announced sometime in September. I would say that a big thing also uh, beyond the government aspect, although the government will have a role, is that the number of people employed in, in gasoline stations right now is a multiple greater than the number of people otherwise employed in the oil and gas industry. You know, Depending on where you look, like in the Bureau of Labor Statistics in terms of direct jobs, Let's say there's, you know, 600, 600,000 people by one reckoning in, in oil and gas. There's an additional 900,000 working in gasoline stations. And only about 10% of those are in the food service side of the gasoline station. So, you know, that's, you take 5 billion divided by a million, that's 5,000 per person for those almost million people in gas stations. That's a very low number, right? So this could be a huge economic incentive for uh, those a big portion of those jobs to be retained by moving into uh, charging station jobs and uh, you know having some of the same convenience store you know capabilities associated with those uh, those new facilities. Well, you know, Peter, that that was my uh, the the impetus for my question about you know about location of charging uh, of chargers because. Um, I'm not sure that if I have to spend 20 or 30 minutes charging my vehicle at an existing fossil fuel gas station that I might want to be there. I might have a greater um, interest in charging at maybe a big box retailer or a restaurant or someplace that just my interaction with that with that retail operation takes, well, 30 minutes or so rather than five. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that redistribution of retail happens. Um, in in yeah. my mind, uh, in my in my mind, I was th thinking back to uh, you know, I've done some road trips on Route 60, Route 66 out west, and there are the remnants of gas stations very close to each other. But that was back when every vehicle, every few miles, needed uh, got a flat tire or needed spark plug wires or or something. Um, yeah, it's interesting because when you uh, you know when you charge an EV, you plug it in. You don't have to stay there by the nozzle like you do with a gasoline nozzle. So you can uh, you can plug your car in and be able to go in for some bit of a restaurant. It's typically going to be fast food. You're not going to have a sit down dining one hour meal no, while you're no, charging your not. EV. But you can certainly plug your car in have some fast food, do a little bit more enhance, enhanced shopping. So maybe some of these shopping plazas that you see at gas stations evolve a little bit differently as EV chargers mm -hmm. appear. That's that's exactly my point, Rick, because I, you know, typically you go, you might you might fuel your car, or you you run in, you get a coffee and uh, you come back out and it's a few minutes. Um, that interaction model is going to change. Right. I mean, I get a text message on my phone. Hey, charging will be complete in five minutes. Go out and unplug your car. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, I've seen the the business case models, the revenue models on chargers and the payback on um, higher level chargers on you know, superchargers um, or 
is much greater be simply because there's a higher throughput of char of you know charging sessions. Yeah, it, it makes sense, and you know that that old saying that uh, it always seems impossible until it's done really comes to mind here. That it it is going to get built out. The, the exact form is going to vary from what we thought, and um, you know it's it, it's amazing that the interstate highway system got built when it did, and it turned out it was kind of coincidental. Uh, Decades earlier, as a low-ranking uh, Army uh, employee, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower was on a project to drive from coast to coast with an Army convoy. They wanted to see how long it would take, uh, and it, they averaged six miles an hour. It was miserable. So when Eisenhower became president, he was highly motivated <laughs> to fund to call for the funding of the interstate highway system that we now have. Yeah. In, indeed, and that's what we might be seeing with uh, President Joe Biden's National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program that uh, you know is launching um, as, as we speak. Well, gentlemen, this has been a, a fascinating hour. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we close for the day? I just want to add one thing about my expectation as an EV owner. You know, when I first bought that EV, I was very concerned I'm going to run out of power. I need to be able to find a way to get my generator. So if I ran out of power, I could go and uh, pick, you know, go and recharge my car and or, you know, rather than have to call a tow truck and tow me to a charge point. It didn't take very long for owning a car to realize that the digitization of the car and the infrastructure of that of that car is so well thought out that it is almost impossible to run out of electric power unless you intentionally try to do that. So range anxiety that I had even as an early as an engineer and an early EV owner, and I kind of understood a lot of things, that range anxiety quickly subsided. And certainly uh, that range anxiety would would subside even quicker if I knew, uh, regardless of what kind of vehicle I owned, that there was an ample number of charge stations within a short amount of time that my car knew about where they were and whether they're open and how many of them are in service at this time. Well, well, Rick, the you know this national infrastructure program in, in the United States is calling for 500,000 chargers by 2030, and that's uh, you know well well in excess of the 45 or 46,000 chargers that are out there today. Yep. Great. Hey, that would change the economics for, uh, greatly. Us on the, on the yeah, show. thank you so much. Wonderful. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank Good. you. Thank you very much. And for to the, for all your listeners here, uh, we look forward to um, seeing you on a next on our next edition of the Smart City Podcast. Thank you very much. Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, the Smart Cities Podcast is the only podcast dedicated to all things smart cities. The podcast is the creation of ARC Advisory Group's Smart City Practice. ARC advises leading companies, municipalities, and governments on technology trends and market dynamics that affect their business and quality of life in their cities. To engage further, please like and share our podcast or reach out directly on Twitter at Smart City Viewpoints or on our website at www.arcweb.com backslash industries backslash smart dash cities.